everything. Hello, everyone. It is counselor at large, Julia Mejia. And you're tuning in to Woke Women Wednesdays when we talk about all things black and brown, the breakdown in the time of COVID. I am your host for this evening and you know how it works. On Wednesdays at 11 o'clock in the morning, you wake up and get the tea from my sister in service, Senator Diane Wilkerson. And then at eight o'clock on Wednesday nights, I come to you I'm always with a little bit of news of what's happening on the council and I'm creating space to connect with um, other uh, dope women across the city who are doing amazing work. Um, today's special guest is someone who I met years ago, pounding the pavement, working on these out, out in these streets, um, organizing and, and literally um, not only connecting people to resources, but creating an opportunity for us to really support our returning citizens, right? These are our incarcerated loved ones. And oftentimes in this space, um, those who are most impacted are usually left out of every conversation. And this young woman that's gonna be joining us here tonight, I met out and about uh, doing the work and um, I have seen her continue to do the work over the last five or six years um, and I'm so incredibly grateful to have her join us um, tonight. So without further ado, tonight my special guest is Carla Montero, yes, yes. who is running for at-large um, city council alongside me and I am excited extremely excited about the amazing field of women who are stepping into their power and running. And one of the reasons why I have so much love and admiration for Carla is because in many ways, she reminds me so much of me. Um, uh, she is gritty. Uh, she is a little bit rough around the edges, but more importantly, she is so deeply connected to the community. And during COVID, Carla was one of my go-to uh, people who was able to connect us, our office directly to people who are living the realities and experiencing extreme hardships. And it was under her leadership that we were able to not only connect, but to be able to provide um, resources to. Um, and so I'm gonna ask her a few questions, but before we dive in, Carla, introduce yourself, tell us who you are um, and why you're running. Sure. So I am Carla Montero. I'm running for Boston City Council at large. I'm the daughter of Kate Brody, an immigrant, a mom, a social worker, a community advocate, um, and a Dorchester girl born and raised. Um, and so I'm running um, for Boston City Council at large because I have experienced um, food insecurities, have also been on the brink of homelessness. And a lot of the things that were a reality for me still remain the reality for many Boston um, residents. And as, um, you know, as somebody who sees this and who is still doing the work as a community advocate and as a social worker, I see a lot of the same gaps in services that I experienced when I was 19, when I became a mom. And so um, for those reasons, I'm running uh, for a more equitable um, housing, education, um, and to also support people with mental health and um, mental illness and substance use disorder as well. Awesome. So Carla, so for people to really understand the genius that's in front of us, um, the amazing human being, can you just talk to us a little bit about your journey um, growing up here in the city of Boston? Uh, just kind of help us understand your, your story a little bit. Sure. I think a lot of a lot of my work is related to the things that impacted me when I was growing up. So um, my family was evicted when I was four years old and, um, you know, we were evicted because the landlord had said to my mom once my dad left that he didn't rent to women. And so my mom had to leave. And so it sort of shaped my trajectory where I was like, I'm going to buy a house, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the age of 16, I worked at Mass General Hospital in um, the dietary program and had said that I was going to save up money to buy a house. But of course, I spent all that money on clothes. Um, age of 23, um, I took the home bias program. I became a mom at the age of 19. I turned 20 that year um, and then eventually became a single mom. But at 23, I took the home bias program and purchased um, a triple decker and moved my family in. Um, but prior to all of that, I experienced so many um, so many obstacles to get there. Um, you know, I was on welfare, I depended on welfare to survive. I was earning $9 an hour at one job, $10 an hour at the other. 
and my food stamps were decreased from $110 to $10 um, because they thought I was making too much money doing overtime. Um, and so those are the things that heavily impact, impacted me and also losing so many friends to gun violence in the prison system. And so, um, and I grew up in the crack cocaine um, era. And so a lot of my friends' families were struggling with addiction. And so I actually work in addictions now at Brigham and Women's Hospital in an addictions clinic. I work in the emergency psychiatric department. And like, as you know, when we work together, I um, worked at the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department, working in the Family Matters program and other programs, um, empowering women. Um, I hosted women's groups um, to empower them and also did groups with men and taught them a lot about credit and how to purchase a house. And, you know, these are all the things that were not taught growing up. And so, um, like I said, my work is deeply rooted in the things that have impacted me or have impacted the people in my community and the people around me. And that's why I'm so passionate um, as a community advocate. I'm so passionate about advocating and supporting the people in our community. And why do you believe right now in this moment in time why leadership like yours is exactly the type of voice that we need um, on the council? Sure, for a few reasons. One, I provide, I am, as a social worker, I have a social work lens that looks, think, looks at things from a holistic perspective. So two, as you know, when COVID hit, I allocated thousands of PPE kits and delivered it to the most marginalized and most underserved communities. You know, we know that there are so many people who are, live in our communities who are undocumented, living in mixed households. Um, and we know that people of color were impacted the most in um, the pandemic, but that's something that I did on my own. Um, I saw that there was a problem and I thought of a solution and delivered those masks from the trunk of my car everywhere I went, Franklin Park, Park, um, um, Castle Island, um, the banks where, you know, I delivered PPE kits to the laundromat, to the liquor store, and also to the, to the corner stores where people would frequent. And I also delivered, it also passed them out um, on election day because um, I knew that I would capture a lot of people. And so, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of leadership that this city needs, somebody who sees a problem and takes care of it. And I'm also, I also believe in collaborating. And so, you know, collaborating with you was also awesome too, because it was, we needed those resources. There were so many people who didn't have access to diapers and white people have lost their jobs. And so collaboration with people like you who understand what it's like to, you know, to struggle and to, you know, be a mom and all of those things. And that's why, you know, that's why we're passionate about this work because we want to help people because we've been there as well. And so in a time of healing and recovery, um, I think it's important to have somebody who has the lived experience that I have and also the professional experience as a social worker and as a community advocate who has been boots on the ground uh, doing the work and understand the actual the gaps in services and how it's impacting people. So let's just um, stay there for a little bit longer, Carla, right? Because in order for people to really appreciate the type of leadership that you will bring, it's not just about having the lived experience and the professional experience, but you also have this ability of connecting with people who are living the realities and bringing them in to the space, which is one of the things that I think on the council that I've been really focusing on is, is making sure that not only are we creating a space for people to be able to amplify their own voices, but you are also well equipped to be able to bring people in and those lived experiences really will help you inform whatever issues you take on, right? And I think that that is what these times uh, require is, is, is people who, like you said, boots on the ground. And so talk to me a little bit more about the boots on the ground work. Um, I know you, you, you outlined some of the stuff during COVID, but even before COVID, you were always on the boots on the ground. I remember election day in my 2019 race, you were out in front of, um, also in front of the church at Morningstar. Yeah. Yeah. And you were giving out stuff there too. And it wasn't even COVID, but you were out there engaging people and you weren't even running for office or even thinking about running for office, but you were out there. What were you giving out then? I can't remember, but I know you were giving out something. Yeah, so I know you were giving out um, donuts and some food that you were um, supporting the um, the people that were working. Um, so I was actually giving out masks, sanitizers, and soaps um, um, that I had allocated part of the thousands of PPE kits. So I was there in the morning. I did a, my, my own little morning shift before work and then went back after work and stood out there. Um, I also distributed food, um, hot food from um, collaborated. Monica, you know, was doing the food drive and so collaborated and, and well, you know, supported her 
um, delivering food um, till 10 o'clock at night to people, to um, Boston Public School students and the elderly as well. Um, um, I also do research on, I'm, I'm also currently doing research on conditions of confinement um, during the pandemic, um, which attorneys are using our research to um, release people who are incarcerated. It's been clear that people who are incarcerated cannot social distance at the six feet um, requirement and, and haven't had access to enough food and water um, and um, the things that they needed um, during the pandemic. So that's another thing. That's another hat that I wear that um, a lot of people don't know as well. So use, we're using data to dismantle um, the, crim the um, injustices within the criminal field as well. Yeah, and because you've had deep experience in that space, you are also being super mindful of our returning citizens and our loved ones, right? And so those who have experienced incarceration, you have a whole different way of looking at how we can better support them. So can you talk a little bit about that and based on what you learned and um, how your leadership is going to really inform that work? Sure, I think, um, you know, as we know, um, so I worked at um, the Sheriff's Department and so working with women um, and working with men as well um, who are impacted by the incarceration system. And if we really look at it, you know, we know that we, um, people of color has been disproportionately affected by the prison system and the and criminal justice. And so that's why I, um, you know, try to support as much as I could, but we also know that when they return home, you know, they have a record, they have a tough time getting a job. Um, they don't qualify for housing. And these, a lot of times, these are things that they don't know. So during my, my time there, I educated them on, you know, how to build their credits. Some that they never knew, not, some of them had never even looked at their credit score or knew what that meant. Um, and so, you know, these are things that are important for us to talk about and to educate kids in school, you know, financial literacy, like these are all things that are so important that impact us in the future that we don't talk about. And, you know, I, I was telling them, uh, you can turn your hustle into something different. You can buy a triple decker, you can live in the basement and you can rent out the top three floors and make some money. And they were just like, they were just in shock, you know, and I did a survey at the end and their favorite part of the group was learning about, um, uh, about credit, learning about how to buy the home buyers program and buying a house, and also learning about um, how the way that they grew up and um, the environments that they grew up in impacted them as adults, and how you know how did they end up here? And so that was something that was really really um, helpful for them to understand why certain things happened, you know, and, and just reassuring them that it's not their fault. Sometimes they're just this is our condition, living conditions, and it, this is what happens, you know. Yeah. So can you tell us how if people wanted to support you, make a donation, uh, join Carla's crew, what, the, what does that look like? Um, yeah. So you can go to Carla for Boston dot com um, and our website is, you know, on our website, you can donate, you can sign up to volunteer. Um, you know, we I welcome you to join Carla's crew. We're a fun crew. Um, so I welcome you to join there. And there's a lot more information about me on there as well. So you can learn more. Um, and you can also contact us if you have any questions as well. And what about on your socials? How can they find you? So they can find me on all social media platforms at CarlaForBoston.com. I'm sorry, Carla for Boston at all of social media platforms. Yes. Um, and, and so tell us, what would you say was the uh, the scariest thing for you so far on the campaign trail? Was making the decision to run? What what would you say has been one of the most scariest moments for you so far? I think definitely making the decision to run, going back and forth, um, calling people like you <laughs> to ask, you know, for advice. Um, but I'm I'm grateful for all of the people who um, have been so supportive and who encouraged me to run. Um, so I'm thankful for all of that. I think that it's always scary for us to, you know, challenge ourselves and to um, engage in new, you know, in new things, but we have to do it. I felt like if I didn't do it, then I would um, probably live with regret because I love serving the community and a large part of this job, in addition to um, policies, is also constituent services. And that's something that I love doing. That's something that I've already been doing. Um, and so I really wanted to serve the community and advocate and be a voice as somebody who has all of these, you know, experiences who understand firsthand what trauma does and the way that mental illness impacts us um, and poverty and all of the things that we experience. And I believe, you know, an upward mobility. And so we have to support each other. Um, one thing I always say is no matter where I am in life, I've never closed the door on the people behind me. I have my number is still the same since I was 18 years old and I don't change it because everybody still calls with they need resources. Um, you know, people DM me all the time for services. That's why, you know, I, I, when I talked to you, I was like, oh, we need diapers, you know, um, because people 
know that I, you know, want to advocate and I want to support them. So people call me or text me, email me, DM, you know, all the time for services or for resources. So, um, so I, I, you know, was happy to make the decision after, after the fear. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so glad that you did, Carla, because you have to recognize is that you, you said this on the campaign trail so far is that you've been doing the work, right? So you didn't just wake up one day and decide that you're going to be an, an elected official or a politician, but the real basic um, function of a city councilor is to really help remove the hardships that our 700,000 constituents are dealing with, um, and then also connecting them to the resources. Because I always say that Boston is resource rich, but coordination poor. And having someone who knows how to case manage, because that's a lot of the work that you've done, mm -hmm. that's what you do as a city councilor. And I think that oftentimes people miss that beat, and we focus so much of our city council work in a lot of forums around the policy. But let me just tell you is that at the end of the day, when a constituent calls you, all they care about is whether or not you're going to help them exactly. address their BHA situation or the, the issue that they're having with the Boston Public Schools, like being able to navigate city um, offices and then connecting them to the resources that they need. That is what the work, work is about. In addition to creating policies that will help alleviate those hardships. But the basic function is constituent services. And I'm so glad that you hit upon that because that always gets lost in yeah. every single forum. Nobody talks about the little things that city councilors do that make an everyday difference on the people's lives that we are here to represent. So talk a little bit more about your case management work as a social worker, and even when you were at the sheriff's department, like that, the work that you've done has prepared you for this moment in time. I completely agree. I get asked a lot of times when I'm outside, how old am I? Um, I think people think I'm a lot younger um, than I am. But, um, you know, I, you know, working at the sheriff's department, connecting people, you know, when they're releasing, um, connecting them to, you know, Fathers of Lift was one of our um, team members that were so was so helpful in helping people navigate when they were releasing. Um, and then working with you and your team as well, and so um, and all of the all of the providers at our, our at our table, you know, that we worked with to make sure that people had services, whether it was um, people from DCF or from the courts. Um, it's so important to have that collaborative approach because you know, not not everything is just it, everything is multifaceted, right? And so we have all of these issues that impact people, and we have to be able to know. So we have to be able to understand where those resources resources are and how to have um, connect people to those resources but also the relationships that we build. You know, I can call somebody and say, hey, you know, I need a detox for someone. Do you have beds, you know, or whatever it is. I have access to those resources because I've been doing the work. You know, I also delivered um, PPE kits to, to AHOPE um, for, um, so that when they distributed safe injection kits, that they can deliver the, the PPE kits with them as well. And then they gave me safe injection kits for my patients. And so, you know, I think a lot about how, you know, my patients don't have access to life-saving medications because, they don't have IDs, but they, and they also don't have an address. They they are experiencing homelessness. They don't have the money. They don't have access to transportation for, for their care. And so these are all of the gaps that impact people's safety and care, you know. And so, um, you know, also, you know, thinking about my people with, you know, who are going through DCF, they can't get their kids back because they don't have housing, but housing will give them a place without their kids. And so, you know, during um, my time at the jail, um, also working with Carla Walker and give her a shout out, um, you know, making sure that we were able to allocate toys and um, different things from um, Home for Little Wanderers. Um, um, I gotta give Rochelle a shout out too, who, you know, helped us make sure that the people who were incarcerated, we were able to distribute um, toys to their kids. And, you know, we bought gift cards. I had the parents sign it. This was the first Christmas that a lot of them had a, a signed card from their parent. Mm -hmm. And that was me going above and beyond because I know I grew up without my father. So I know um, how much that impacts kids. And so I think it's so important um, for us to make sure that we're doing the work. It's not just about what's our job. It's all about, um, for me, it's always been about going above and beyond because my mother has always, you know, she's raised us to take care of others. It's something that's been instilled in me for such a long time. Um, and I think if we can make sure that everybody has access to basic needs, and I always say, you know, I'm an example of what meeting basic needs looks like and knowing how to access resources. You know, I use Dress for Success for an outfit for my job interview because I didn't have money to buy clothes. I was on welfare 
and I used, um, you know, I went to Jewish vocational services for job training. Here I was at 20, 20 years old and went to underfunded schools and never learned how to use a computer. So I didn't even know how to turn a computer on. I remember somebody telling me to go on Internet Explorer and I was like, what is that? You know, um, but I went to Jewish vocational services and, you know, did the job training and was able to have to learn how to do um Microsoft Office and, and medical billing. And so that's sort of what opened the doors for me to get the job at, at Verizon. And so, you know, it's so important to know where those resource, resources are and how to access them. And then I used the Home Buyers Program through MAHA um, in uh, Massachusetts Alliance. Uh, sorry, I'm always messing up their name, <laughs> Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance, and was able to purchase a house at the age 27. And I had turned 28 that year. But if people have access to the resources and that we're making them more visible and that we can connect people, like this is the result. This is what could happen. I returned to college 14 years after graduating from high school and was able to obtain my associates, my master's um, and my master's as well. Yes, so just for success is phenomenal. <laughs> yes, I'm so, see, you know, oftentimes, Carla, you get into these um, forums and they only give you a minute to answer a question and then all this richness about who you are, how you lead, what drives you, gets, you, there's just not enough time to unpack these things. And that's why I think it's so important for, for this platform for you to be able to really help people understand how well equipped you are, not just with the resources, but your ability to collaborate with people, bringing people into the space um, and then designing alongside those who are living the realities how we're going to fix this, right? Because we already know all that was wrong with the system. Mm -hmm. I always go back to what it is that we're going to do about it. And if exactly. we don't have the political will and the right foot soldiers in and on the outside, then it's just going to be a whole bunch of blah, 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 right? So that sense of urgency is what these times require. And I'm so incredibly grateful that you answered the call to run um, and that you are stepping into your power to do just that, to represent um, your constituents. So again, for those who are just tuning in, we're talking with at-large uh, city councilor uh, candidate, uh, counsel, uh, I was going to call you counselor Carla Montero. Thank you for your existence. <laughs> Thank you for your y'all, um, who is running at-large, which means that basically she, she would represent the entire city of Boston. So that means all 22 neighborhoods, no matter where you live, if you believe Carla has what it takes to represent you, which I hope that you do, um, you can vote for her. And I just want to be really clear because people think I'm crazy because I'm inviting people who are running for the same um, seat that I'm running for as to why would I create a platform for this to happen. And the, the I know what it was like for me as a first term, a first time candidate, a grassroots one as at that, who had very limited access to resources, fundraising and networks, um, nobody really thought that I had what it took, but I had heart and I had the people. And when you lead with your heart and you do this and you are relentless about who it is that you're trying to uplift, then it's gonna be really difficult for those dollars um, to match that, right? And Carla, I just really want you to continue to remain hopeful, to remain grounded, to remain true to who you are and never leave yourself at the door because you think that you need to shift and shape to something else just so that you could be digestible. No, Carla, you got to come as you are because this is what we need more of. And I want you to stand in that power and embrace it, you know? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's hard. I think, you know, like going back to the forums, it is challenging, you know, um, as most people know, because I talk about it openly, I am somebody who has, um, who lives with anxiety. And so there are some weeks that my anxiety is a little, um, a little tougher to navigate than others. And so, um, so I may not show, so my personality and everything else may not show up at the forums. But one thing that, um, that I always do is I always show up to do the work and I get things and I get it done. And so, and I'm here to support people. You know, I, um, my best attributes I always say is, you know, identifying needs collectively and connecting people to services and supporting them in the way that they feel um, they should be supported. And so, um, as I said, I always show up no matter what, but I think we also need to um, make sure that, you know, we're not, you know, um, stigmatizing people because of mental illness and, and things like that. And so, um, you know, it's so important for all of us to 
be supportive of each other and to, to know that these things are happening in, in our city. And, and, you know, especially there's so many homes that we don't talk about mental health at all. And right. so that's why mental health and substance use is part of my platform, because I, I call it, you know, mental health movement that we need to bring a mental health movement to the city of Boston, because yeah. if your mental health is not great, then it's going to be really hard to navigate other parts of your life. And so we need to make sure that we're highlighting that and that we're open and transparent. And that's why I speak openly about it, because I'm not embarrassed. There's nothing wrong with us. Um, we just need to take care of ourselves a little bit more. And self-care is very important. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Yes, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about your candidacy, um, because you are, especially now with COVID, you're really going to be able to set people up for success um, by by talking about these issues so openly and then not just talking about them, but building the infrastructure for us to confront them, right, in ways that are healthy. Um, and I always say I see so much of myself in you. Um, Carla and I really am excited to to see you um, joining this um, this field um, and you know and not just being a voice but being a fighter um, for what these times require and so I just wanted to just thank you for 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 your leadership and everything that you've done even before you decided to run and all the things that you continue to do as a candidate and amplifying the truth because people are not we're not going to change the status quo unless we change the conversation. And I think that you're doing that in every space that you're showing up in. Um, and you're you're showing people what is possible by being your true authentic self. Um, and so don't ever leave Carla at the door to make anyone feel comfortable because you don't do anyone any justice, including the people that you want to represent. So always be as fearless um, and as ferocious as uh, you need to be because that is what we need more of. Um, and so tell us again one more time because we're almost at time, believe it or not. Already? It's been so much fun. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so if you could, someone just said here, Carla, you mentioned anxiety. Um, please inbox me after this um, segment. Homestosis is truly important. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but whatever. Okay. I'll, I'll put it right here. Um, Renadine wants you to connect um, with her after the segment. So make sure you inbox her and do I just will. that. Um, and listen, this is an opportunity for us to change the conversation and having more people like you um, running and, and doing just that is what's going to disrupt the status quo. So I just want to applaud you for, for stepping into the big platform. You could have taken the easier route. Um, running for district is, is just as equally as hard, but running citywide and bringing a message um, to a broader uh, community is is a bigger challenge and I know that you're up for it um, you have been and you continue to show up in ways that these times require so so thank you again if people want to um, connect with Carla I'm gonna put um, her social uh, media it's Carla for Boston right yes Carla for Boston on social media and then Carla for Boston dot com for the website um, and Julia I also want to just thank you because it, it's funny because I um, was telling my brother when you you spoke at Year Up, and he's like, this amazing woman um, came to speak to, to us at Year Up, and I was like, what's her name, Julia Mejia? And he said yes, and I had told him how I was in these meetings with you, you know, back in 2015, 2016, and I had just admired you. I remember you had on a red top and your makeup was flawless. Um, and I just admired you and the things that you were saying, the ideas that you were sharing. Um, and so, you know, I'm so thankful to have been able to work with you all these years. And I was obviously so proud of you for running as well. Um, and thank you for encouraging me, you know, to run and to be supportive and also being one of those people who doesn't close the door um, behind them and making sure that we have these platforms um, to share these things. I also have to give a shout out too to Big Sister Association of Boston because I am also a big sister. I know you, you helped them out this weekend, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but also just wanted to give a shout out um, to Big Sister. I've been a mentor for the past six or seven years um, to a young girl in the community. And so I've done a lot of different things to support and give back. Um, but, and it doesn't stop there. There's so much more work to do. And I really hope that I can have one of your four votes. I hope that you are able to follow us. And, and, and you know, fundraising is challenging for somebody like me who grew up in, just like Julia, who grew up in an underserved community. And I'm also a social worker. And we work three jobs just to make ends meet. So 
Um, so it's a lot more challenging for me to fundraise. So I would you know, appreciate any donations and, and, and sharing. But thank you, Julia. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, absolutely. So I, I think it's important for people to know that it's not just about my election, right? That this is about a bigger conversation and making sure that we are putting the right people in place who are gonna move the work forward. Um, and so, of course, I'm gonna open the door always. Um, you know, this is this is not about me, this is about we and building alongside people like you who have been on the ground every day doing the work even before you even realize that you were already a city councilor, right? Like <laughs> you're only responding. Now we just need to give you the title and the pay and the and the office so that you can keep doing your work. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for, for joining me tonight on Woke Women Wednesday. It was um, always great to be in your presence, even if it's just in this way. So don't forget Carla for Boston, make a donation, check out her platform, join Carla's crew. Um, because she's here for you. All that rhymes. Yes. Yes. Julia. Um, Julia, I also just want to say one thing to the voters. Um, you know, when they're thinking about who they're going to choose for their four at large counselors, you know, you want to look at what the team looks like, right? What are the perspectives that people can bring to work together to do this work, right? And so, um, you know, like I always, you know, in this crowded field, you know, for me, I bring, you know, I bring my lived experience, my professional experience and my my experience as a community member. Um, and so, you know, you want to look at what everybody brings to the table and how we can collectively work together to make sure that we're advocating and fighting for you. So make sure that you're choosing people with different perspectives um, or similar perspective. You know, it is kind of a balance. But just making sure that you you know figure out what your what your team looks like that are, is going to represent you and bring the voices um, of the people in, in in every single community in the city of Boston. Yes, and I would like to say before my lights go completely out here because I I I don't want to get up and turn on the lights, but I wanted to just quickly also say that you have four votes for at large, and you don't have to choose between me and Carla. You can actually vote for both of us, and I think that's really important for people to know that they don't have to choose. They have four at large votes and you could choose both of us. Um, so thank you again, Carla, for joining us tonight. I look forward to continuing to building alongside you and um, cheering you on on your journey. Um, and it, it doesn't take courage. What it takes is heart and you already have it. So keep on keeping on, okay? Thank you, Julia. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks All for right. having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Have Bye. a good night. Okay, bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Don't forget to vote for me, Carl. Oops, sorry. Wait, wait. Go, go. Say that again. Say it again. Sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say, don't forget to look at my platform. And if you can share on social media and um, tell your friends about me. Thank you. Yes. Carla for Boston, um, dot com and follow her on all social media at Carla for Boston. All right, Carla. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you Julia. Bye. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me tonight on Woke Women Wednesday when we talk about all things black and brown. So you all got a little quick um, peek at Carla Montero, who is one of your four at-large uh, city councilors, um, uh, uh, candidates. So I'm always speaking it to an existence. Make sure you go out and vote and you represent. And thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget next Wednesday at 11 in the morning, um, you wake up with Senator Diane Wilkerson and at 8 o'clock with me, okay? So we'll see you then. Until then, be well, be safe, and stay out of trouble. Bye.